went and tell them, in the name of Christ, I greet you. As you find your seats, I invite you to also find that registration pad. It's green. It's somewhere on your row or at your table. I invite you to find that and sign in. Let us know that you are here this morning, especially if you are a guest with us. We do appreciate getting your um, information, even if it's just an email, so that we can um, greet you and give you some more information about us. Um, as the kids are settling in, also... <laughs> Reminder that we have an Easter egg hunt on Saturday. Who's excited? Yeah, they're excited, but we need your help. So we still need um, some cupcakes and some plain sugar cookies that we can decorate. So you don't even have to decorate, you just have to bake them. Um, we also need some hands-on volunteers too. And so right back there, is a sign-up sheet, and we would appreciate if you could sign up and help us out um, in, in the next Saturday from 10 to 12 on Saturday. All right, good morning, boys and girls. Um, I have something here. Wait, see, now can you turn around so you can see? What does it say? Need food. Need food. Yes, it does. It is written on a Girl Scout box. Um, need food. Do any of you ever need food? No, not really. I mean, we need food to make our bodies strong and healthy, right? But there's always food in your house, right? There's always something. May not be what you want, but there's always something, right? There's at least some little thing that you can eat. And so, have any of you ever been driving with your grown-ups and seen somebody holding a sign like this? No. Yes, yes, you have. We've talked about it, so yes, you have. <laughs> you have, right? Hey, Cobus, can you pay attention right here? Thanks. Yep. Yep. Sometimes that happens too. But so sometimes the sign will say, um, veteran, help me, or family, need money. And you know, sometimes those people just, they didn't do anything to end up in that position. They may have lost their job, and then they don't have a way to feed their family. And it's really hard for us to know, right? Sometimes we just drive right on by and because sometimes it's a, it's a person that we know has been on that corner and for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so sometimes we get a little, mm, I don't know if they really need our help. And then sometimes though, we may roll down our window. I did this to roll down my window. I just showed my age. They don't know what that means. Sometimes we push the button and roll down our window, and, and we might hand out a dollar or two, or sometimes in our car we have crackers and water, or maybe a leftover container of food, and so I'll, I'll pass that out the window too, and just something to help the, the person that's standing on the corner that may need our help. So think about some ways and some stuff you might be able to keep in your car that can help um, our neighbors who are in need, okay? Because Jesus tells us that when you help a neighbor, you're helping him, right? All right, can we pray together? Dear God, thank you for giving us enough food. Help us to help others who need food. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. All right, it's Communion Sunday, so you guys get to go back and sit with your grown-ups. At this time, our praise team invites you to be in a posture of worship, and we're going to continue our praise and worship music this morning. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, 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 let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails. The anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins. The echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh. gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Let's proclaim this together. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. He's always there. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night, when the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. At this time, I invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me this morning. God of grace and goodness, thank you for letting us gather here today on this beautiful day. We opened up the windows, let your light shine in. What a glorious Sunday to be together, God. <laughs> As Shannon said, you are good, you are good. God, allow your light to shine in on our lives. Show us all the disjunctions we have between your truth and where we are. Give us the bravery and the courage to hand that over to you, to give it up today, God. It's not ours. It's yours. Lost or saved, find 
find the way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every fear has no place at the sound of your great name the enemy he has to leave at the sound of your great name Jesus worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us the Son of God and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great name all the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great name the fatherless they find the rest at the sound of your great name the sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name Jesus worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us the Son of God and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great name Jesus Jesus worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us Son of God and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great name he's our redeemer redeemer my healer lord almighty defender my savior you are my king redeemer my healer lord almighty defender my savior you are my king jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us son of god and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great may be seated.
The homeless beggars. You can give them down. We got plenty of light. We're good. Um, this morning, we are continuing our study of the Gospel of Luke, noticing especially the ways in which Luke lifts up God's deep and abiding love and concern for those whom the world around them has written off as nobodies. Last week, we saw how Jesus showed mercy to the shamed and judged, the woman that anointed Jesus' feet. And today, we're going to wrestle with God's love for the poor and how our actions and inactions today affect this group of nobodies. If you notice up, up front here, you probably are, are going, what is all this stuff? And, and in the midst of the altar, we have things and Holy Communion. But all of this is our donations to Methodist Family Health. And there's an equal number of, uh, of bounty, I guess is the best word to put it, um, over in the sanctuary as well. And I, I wanted, uh, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. Um, I, myself, hadn't really seen that anyone had brought anything. Like I saw a package of toilet paper and a thing of paper towels here and there, but I didn't know that we had collected so much until I walked into the next gen director's office this last week and went, oh my goodness. And Casey says, oh yeah, I've been putting it in there. And I went, I didn't know we'd collected this much. And so neither does all of, do all of you. And so I wanted us to see what good we can bring about for a group of nobodies that society has forgotten or written off. And so here is just um, a sampling of things. You can still bring more things. Um, of course, the list is um, in your uh, Linton devotional stuff, and there's also signs that are around too. This morning, though, we're going to look at how God's love and how our actions and inactions affect the poor. We're looking in, of course, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. One more page over. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he regained his sight, and people followed him, uh, and followed him, glorifying God, and all the people, when they saw it, Praised God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Poverty is one of those terms that is extremely relative. On a worldwide scale, about half of all people, more than three billion of them, live on less than two dollars and fifty cents per day. While in the United States, the officially defined poverty line for a family of four is an annual income of $24,250, or $16.61 per person per day. Worldwide, almost 80% of the extremely poor live in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and yet 14% of American households are considered food insecure, meaning they lack access to enough food for an active, healthy life for all household members. 
I think we can all agree that poverty in America definitely looks different than poverty in Africa. But in both places, the reality is that poverty shackles freedom, crushes hope, cripples relationships, and even kills, with children very often suffering disproportionately. It hasn't always been this way. The ancient Jews had a culture that cared well for those who might otherwise be destitute. And while there was certainly a level of relative poverty, the kind of extreme poverty that reduced one to begging for food was simply not a reality. The Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, included rules that prevented this from happening. Take, for example, from Leviticus 19. It says, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines, and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and foreigners who live among you, for I, the Lord, am your God. Jewish widows and strangers in particular were allowed to go and glean from the fields as a way to ensure that they didn't go hungry. By the time Jesus arrived on the scene, however, things had begun to change. Large cities like Jerusalem had been established and were ruled by empires that were hungry to levy taxes. They were, there were head taxes, land taxes, special military requisitions, tolls on goods brought to market, and the despised tax collectors. Now, I don't know if you are like me, but I received in the mail this week my Benton County property tax assessment and also had a word about those despised tax collectors. Some things don't change. Palestinian fishermen, farmers, and artisans might have paid as much as 40% of the value of their goods in taxes to the Roman Empire without any tangible benefits in exchange, such as Social Security or unemployment insurance or Medicare. As a result of these exorbitant taxes, many accumulated debt that resulted in forfeiture of their land, the inability to work, and even slavery and torture. Excessive taxation and confiscation of land saw Jewish culture move from having one group of people who are relatively poor but still able to eat, what we might call today the working poor, to having for the first time a sizable population of people who were completely disconnected from resources other than begging. This is the setting for our scripture reading this morning. Now, while most of us will never experience this kind of extreme poverty, there are vast disparities in our abilities to provide for ourselves due to differences in health and incomes, education, and family connections. And so, while your life probably doesn't look as bad as the blind beggar, it's entirely possible that you might feel like him at some point in your life. About three out of four Americans live paycheck to paycheck with virtually no emergency savings. That combined with soaring health care costs, increased credit card debt, and the tendency of Americans to want to buy more house than they can really afford means that some of us are only one or two paychecks away from being on the street begging for food and money. If you've ever had to skip a meal, forgo going to the dentist or the doctor, or been unable to replace a pair of worn out shoes, then you can relate at least a little to how the lack of money can limit and exclude you from the people and activities around you. The story of the blind beggar is a cautionary tale for those of us who don't struggle with poverty. Those, the world says, are economic somebodies, but who turn an indifferent eye to the poor. 
Now remember, if you are living on more than $16.61 per day, you are considered rich. You are considered not below the poverty line. Now it's important to also understand here that the rich aren't being condemned for being rich, but rather for their indifference to the plight of the poor. Albert Einstein once said that the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. Martin Luther King Jr. agreed, saying, Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. But perhaps Mother Teresa gave the most penetrating commentary of all when she said, When a poor person dies of hunger, it has not happened because God did not take care of him or her. It has happened because neither you nor I wanted to give that person what she or he needed. God cares about the homeless beggars and all the other nobodies who are lacking what they need in this world. The question is, do we? Back to our blind beggar. Notice first that the man is described in two ways, that he is blind and he is a beggar, neither of which was particularly surprising in that time. And we can reasonably surmise that the man is a beggar exactly because he is blind. Remember that this is a time when there's no braille and no guide dogs and no GPS and no audible traffic signals. Um, or any of the other modern devices used to, um, that we have to allow the visually impaired to live fully engaged lives. So the man is a nobody. Uh, not one, but two counts. He has no vision, and he has no way to provide for himself. The blind beggar next does something that should remind us of the parable of the persistent widow um, that's earlier in chapter 18. And she repeatedly appealed to the judge, the local judge, for justice. Just like the blind man doesn't take no for an answer when the crowds try to shut him down. Remember, he yells out to Jesus, and they were like, hey, shush, be quiet. And he yells louder. There's a lesson here for all of us when we find ourselves in the position of the blind beggar. Part of it, what it means to be faithful in our prayers for God's provision and healing is to be persistent in going into God's presence and honestly asking for what we need. What we must remember, though, is that sometimes God's provision and healing are not what we think it should be. Next, note what Jesus does not do. He doesn't simply walk on by. He, how many times have each of us walked by someone who's asking us for help? I mean, more times than I can count. And Jesus stops, meets the man face to face, and then does something amazing. He asks a question. Do you, have you ever noticed how Jesus begins relationships often by asking a question? Remember, this is the Son of the Most High, all-knowing and all-powerful. So he really has no need to ask anyone anything. But Jesus understands that ministry is about relationship. And so he models this basic strategy for us, and he cuts right to the heart of the matter, right? He says, what do you want me to do for you? I want you to try to remember the last time you were ministering with someone in need. And it might have been a family member or a stranger or a friend. It might have been in person or it might have been on the phone or it may even have been over Facebook. But did you at any time come right out and ask that question? What do you want me to do for you? When I was in seminary, one of the essential skills that we practiced and reflected on repeatedly and endlessly, I felt, in my pastoral care class was simply helping people discover what it is they need. Jesus gets right to the point, what do you want me to do for you? 
Next, notice what the blind man does not ask for. He doesn't ask Jesus for money, even though that would have been what was expected. Um, Asking for alms was what beggars did at the time of Jesus. And in the New Testament, it even lifts up alms giving to beggars as virtuous. But anyone passing by on the road could have given the man money. And so he asks for his eyesight. The one thing that Jesus can provide that nobody else can. Knowing that if he recovers his eyesight, he'll be able to work again. And once again, Jesus offers the man the mercy he asks for and heals him. There's quite a bit of debate today over how we might best help people in poverty, especially beggars, those who we often call panhandlers, those that are standing on the corners by the interstate. In an article in Christianity Today, the author asks an excellent question. How can we persuade well-meaning Christians to drop quick-fix, self-gratifying activities and instead pursue the more difficult work of transformation? I know that some of us uh, encountering someone who appears to be living in extreme poverty simply open our wallets and hand out some cash. We do that because it feels like we need to respond in some way in the moment. And that seems to be the fastest and most direct way to respond. And maybe sometimes that is the way we need to respond, and it is the best thing to do. But very often, it's not. Setting aside the ugly reality of scams and alcohol and drug abuse, the blind beggars need something more than money. They need healing. And healing takes time, relationship, and sustained investment. That's why working through established agencies like um, Helping Hands or 200,000 Reasons or our Snack Pack program or the Northwest Arkansas Food Bank are usually more helpful to the poor in the long term and more beneficial. Ideally, a skills training and job placement uh, program might be even better. If you do have the time and the inclination to enter into a relationship with someone in extreme poverty, then I suggest starting the way Jesus did, by asking the question, what can I do for you today? More likely than not, they'll ask you for money. A great many number of people have come to me and left sad because what they really wanted was cash or something they could trade for cash. But there are so many other ways that we might help someone on the street. We could offer to walk with them to a restaurant and buy them a meal. Or if you're going through a drive-thru and it's near that interstate corner, you pick up an extra meal and you hand it out the window. Or one time I took someone to get a haircut She was so excited. We could help them locate a shelter, a free clinic, or a food pantry. I always ask people to tell me their story and offer to pray with them. Sometimes I'm able to help people by brokering um, a reconciliation with a family member who lives in the area. The reality is that for most of these people, The only real long-term solution to their plight is to help them find a job, although many are unable to get or hold a job for a large variety of reasons. We usually can't easily fix the situations the poor find themselves in. It's difficult. We can, however, show the compassion of Jesus to them when we meet them, offer what real help we can, and work with whatever groups we can to advocate the long-term changes necessary to include and empower these nobodies living on the margins of our society. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the pure abundance of resources and wealth that we experience. Even if it might be that we're living on $17 a day. 
we give thanks that we have something. And so, God, this morning we especially pray for the, the nobodies that are in our midst, the people who have no other option but stand on the street corner. God, I also pray for those of us who are living paycheck to paycheck, who worry the three days before the next payday, making sure that the food is there, that the bills are paid. We pray that you continue to bless us with jobs, that you continue to provide when it doesn't look like we may be able to make it. God, we give thanks for the numerous organizations in our area that help, that help in very real and tangible ways. God, I pray that we may still be your hands and feet, that we may support these organizations and one another. God, this morning we pray um, for our community. We pray for Rich Severson and Mickey Shank as they continue to um, have health problems. And we give thanks and ask for continued prayers for Sadie Brem and her health. Lord, we pray this morning for all of those family members, friends, neighbors that continue to need your healing touch, that continue to need our presence with them so that they may feel a little of your love. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of coughing and sniffling, and so yes, it is beautiful outside. It is spring, but we are all congested. This morning, we are partaking of Holy Communion. This is Christ's table, set for us because he sacrificed for us. And all are welcome at this table, all who love Jesus, who repent of their sins, and wish and seek to live in peace and harmony with one another in community in the body of Christ. And so this morning, I invite you to join me in prayer, but as I've said before, um, don't bow your heads so that we may pray with our eyes fully open, our ears fully open, and our hearts fully open to experience um, the prayer of great thanksgiving. So let us pray. Gracious God, forgive us, for we have sinned. We have fallen short. We have not heard the cries of the needy. We have not reached out to our neighbors. And so forgive us where we have fallen short and help us to seek to live in peace and harmony with those around us. And we give thanks to you, God, for the forgiveness that you have offered us and will always offer us in your grace and in your love. Amen. We remember in Christ and God's acts that, that God created, created something out of nothing, created somebodies out of nobodies, created a world, and that this world is good. And in the fullness of time, God created his son and sent his son to be with us, to teach us how to be followers, how to be disciples, to teach us who God is and how God loves. And God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we may be made in right relationship with God. And so the night before Jesus was led to the cross, he sat down with his disciples, his closest friends, and he took bread and he blessed it. 
and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, every time you gather, every time you break bread together, do this in memory and in honor and in celebration of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, the common cup, the cup which they would all share, and he took it, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, every time you drink from this cup together, remember me. Remember my love for you. And so we remember and we proclaim that Christ died. Christ rose and Christ will come again in all glory. And until that day, we remember. And so, God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. May they be for us your body and blood so that we may be redeemed with the world when you come in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet all as one, forgiven and loved people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. As forgiven and freed children of God, I invite you to pray with us the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, um, you will come as you uh, feel led by the Holy Spirit. You will receive a piece of bread and then dip it into the cup and consume both elements at the same time. uh, At that point, you are invited to pray at the altar rails or back in your seat. Also, don't forget as you come forward that the offering baskets are right here. And so you may bring your offering and place it here at the altar, giving just a portion of those resources back to God so that we may continue to do God's ministry in our community. Will those who are assisting please come forward?
So uh, we have more juice coming, um, so just stay tight. Of course, there's already some bread that has both elements <laughs> here, so if you wish to have the um, already combined element bread while we're um, preparing a second cup, you're more than welcome to come um, and, and be with Jim. Come as you will. You hold my every moment You call my raging seas You walk with me through fire And heal our mighty disease I trust in you I trust in you. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. You hold my every moment. You call my raging seas. You walk with me through fire and heal our mighty disease and I trust in you I trust in you I believe you're my healer I believe
Cause you're all I need. This morning, um, in our invitation to Christian discipleship, um, I have a good friend of mine who's actually here this morning. Her name is uh, Bailey Faulkner, and she is the executive director for Ozark Mission Project. And so this morning, she is going to come and tell us a few words. But first, um, I'm going to say a prayer to close our communion time together. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which we can't explain but understand that this body and blood of yours unites us with you in the body of your, of your son. God, be with us as we continue to live as redeemed and Easter people, looking to the hope of resurrection. As in your son's name we pray, amen. Okay, Bailey. Good morning. First, thank you so much, um, Pastor Williams, for allowing me to come and be with your congregation today. My husband, Will, and Sydney are here, and um, I wouldn't be able to travel the state I live in Little Rock if it wasn't for having such a supportive family. And as someone said uh, today here at your church, I said, oh, we came from Little Rock. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. Welcome to the promised land. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to be here. I already feel happier being in Northwest Arkansas. Um, For those of you who are not familiar with Ozark Mission Project, we started back in 1986. There was a group of United Methodists that went to a neighboring state to do mission work um, with their youth, and they thought to themselves, why are we going to another state to do work when there's so much need right here in the state of Arkansas? So they formed a committee. When they got back, I know many of you probably sit on committees, and um, they started OMP. We had our first camp in Imboden, Arkansas, with just 30 campers. The kids went out and they did minor repair work, and um, from there, the OMP grew, and it grew. And um, now we have over 1,000 campers and youth that, um, and adults that participate each year, and we have a college mission trip, and we have an elementary day camp. So when I first started with OMP, um, I had never gone to camp. I, I grew up um, Presbyterian, and we didn't have OMP, um, but my husband went to camp, and so I went undercover. I don't know if you've seen the show Undercover Boss, but I decided that that's what I was going to do. So I went to camp, didn't tell anyone I was the executive director because I had just started at the time, packed my air mattress, slept in a church like this in a Sunday school class, and we went out into the community, and we built wheelchair ramps, we painted houses, and we did yard work. And through that, uh, that experience, I realized that it was so much more, just kind of like going back to what your pastor said in the sermon, it was so much more than building that wheelchair ramp. It was so much more than doing yard work and painting houses. It was about showing the love of Christ to sometimes to people who otherwise would have never experienced that love. It's about being with the needy, and it's about being with the lonely, and actually building that relationship and getting to know them and having lunch with them. So this summer, we're going to have a camp in northwest Arkansas. We're going to have two, one in Fayetteville and one in Rogers. And so we'll be able to do work right here in this community. And we'll be able to do projects for people who wouldn't be able to get out of their home unless we're there to build a wheelchair ramp. So I want to tell you real quick about one of those um, projects. I was at work. It was a typical Monday. And um, I got a phone call from a lady that um, lived in Cabot. And she just called to say thank you. She said, I just want to thank you. I went, oh, okay, great. And she said, "Um, there was a group out here this summer, and y'all built a wheelchair ramp off of my trailer where I could get out of my home on my own. And her son lived with her, and so whenever she needed to leave, her son would literally have to lift up her wheelchair to take her out of the trailer. Well, um, her house caught on fire. Her trailer caught on fire. Her son was at work, and because of the wheelchair ramp that the youth built her, She was able to get out of her home, and she's alive today. That's what this ministry is all about. It's about making sure that every Arkansan can get out of their home safely without relying on help of other people. So today, I ask you to just pray for Ozark Mission Project. Pray for our campers. Pray for our leaders as we gear up for summer. 
be thinking of people right here in your community and agencies that we can partner with to be able to help more families. Contact your church office if you know of anyone. We have applications that they can fill out, and we do all of our work completely free to the families. We don't receive any apportionments from the United Methodist Church. So I ask you today to just prayerfully consider partnering with us. We have an envelope in your bulletin, and so if it is something that you want to do, um, please prayerfully consider doing that. And again, I want to thank you so much for being a church that opens your hearts and opens your doors um, to allow us to come in, and more importantly, for all that you all do in the community and for our state. Thank you. Um, what Bailey didn't say is that you can be a sponsor for $25. That $25 buys a gallon of paint. And so for as little as $25, you can help um, fund so that the families that OMP serves, which are right here in our community, um, does, it's no cost to them. Um, she kind of breezed real fast over that. And so I want to reiterate that, that if you or you have a neighbor that has a need, um, let me know. We do have those applications in the office, and that work is done for them for free. Um, and it's not shoddy work either. Like, it holds up. <laughs> um, I've been to many campsites. Um, other churches I've been part of have hosted camps, um, and they know what they're doing. Uh, they have skilled people um, that are working with the groups of the kids. So it's not, you know, I know some of you youth parents are like, I don't trust my kid to build a wheelchair ramp that's going to stay up. Well, that's because they're helping to build the ramp. <laughs> they're providing some of the labor. So anyway, this is a, a project that also touches a lot of nobodies in our congregation and in our community. And so I implore you, if you wish to make a donation, just put it in the envelope and you can bring it back up here to the, the baskets or bring it by the church office this week. Um, if you make a check, write that out to the church and put it in that envelope or write OMP on the memo line and we'll get all of those funds to OMP at one time. So now, I invite you to stand as you're able for our song of invitation as we close the time of worship today. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and i will see how great how great is our god and age to age, and age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, for the Spirit Son, the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb how great how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and i will see how great how great is our god he's the name He's the name above all names. He is worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing, how great is our God. You're the name above all names. You are worthy. 
How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing that again. How great. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Thank you, praise team, this morning. Um, you're right. You are small but mighty, and thank you for lifting us in worship today. Brothers and sisters, do you love God? Yes. Do you love Jesus? Yes. Do you love the Holy Spirit? Yes. And do you know that God loves you? Yes. Then go forth, sharing God's love and the peace that you have found here today with all whom you meet. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, amen. <laughs>